and get started. Great thing with webinars is that we can get started and we can put it up on the SACAC website so that people can enjoy it later. So thank you so much for joining us for a SACAC Mini Camp College, College Admissions Workshop. And this one is a special one in that it is geared for letters of recommendation, but particularly to our uh, college counselor friends, CBO friends, and others who will have to write letters of recommendation. Well, actually, let me rephrase that. They don't have to write. They have the privilege to write letters of recommendations for so many wonderful students. And so joining me today, we have uh, amazing individuals, but just to let you know, uh, just to give you an overview, of what we're about to uh, go through is we will lo really look at the context of the application and understand that letters of recommendations are from different points of views. And so there are teacher letters of recommendations and counselor slash CBO letters of recommendations. And so we'll talk a little bit about how those two things differ, which they truly do and then talk about how you can get a strong or write a strong letter recommendation based off of uh, tips and tricks and trades uh, throughout the process, as well as how to make sure that the letter is coming across in the most positive light. And so we will address those and uh, really open it up for Q&A at any point, okay? And so before we get too far down the rabbit hole, I am so happy that we have two amazing individuals who have years of experience of both reading and writing letters or recommendations joining us. Christy uh, from North Oconee High School here in Georgia and Julie from the Bowl School in Florida. As you can see her love background setting there. <laughs> and so we will really uh, just share our uh, knowledge, but uh, of course, if there's other um, thoughts that you have, uh, skills or tips that you found throughout the process, please feel free to put that in the chat or in the comment session later, okay? So the first thing I want, uh, oh, I didn't introduce myself. I'll always forget to do that. <laughs> Uh, I am Sarbeth Fleming. I'm the Associate Dean of Admissions at Emory University, and I've been in the field a little bit over two decades, both on the high school side, the CBO side, as well as the college side. And so what I can tell you, as I am actually actively reading applications right now, um, is that to spend 10 to 15 minutes on the application is spending a lot of time on the application. I have, depending on the time of year, I've worked at different colleges where we really would look maybe five to seven minutes per application. And so keeping in mind, that is not just the letters of recommendations, right? When I'm saying five to seven minutes or 10 to 15 minutes, I'm talking about the entire common application all of the essays, so the main uh, essay, if they're doing Common App or if they're doing Coalition or Quest Bridge, all of the essays, the supplemental essays, deciphering the transcript, right? And then looking at letters of recommendation. So there's a lot of information that as a, uh, a, a college rep that I have to sift through in the application. And so letters of recommendations, Truthfully, as someone who used to write them, hundreds of them, and I was like, oh, let me put this phrase here and let me, knowing that the college is going to spend about one to two minutes per recommendation, it's really important to make sure, and we'll talk about it in detail, you're hitting the highlights, you're hitting the points. Um, I, I read a letter actually today, and the, I love that it started with, skipping all of the fluff, let me get to the point. And I was like, yes, because that is helping me. And then knowing also that a lot of colleges will look at it in a school group. When I used to read for one school, and particularly when I got over 50 applications from that one high school, I would really look at 
all of, if Christy was the, uh, the college counselor who was writing the letter of recommendation, I would read all of Christy's letters at one time so that I can get that understanding of how she sees or views this student in the context of the pool. And so um, the school group is really important and keeping that in mind. Um, and so, yes, so we'll do a deeper dive into all of that. All right, well, I am going to talk a little bit about um, types of recommendations. My name is Julie Maloney and I am a college counselor at the Bull School in Jacksonville, Florida. But prior to joining the college counseling side, I also spent some time in admissions as well. Um, and I'm sure like many of us, or maybe some of us on this call, we are wondering if Sarbeth has read some of our letters of recommendation this uh, reading season, quite honestly. So um, we'll get some kind of detailed feedback and pointers uh, on how to approach those. Uh, so let's first start with just the difference between what a counselor and a teacher letter of recommendation is, is really serving in the college application process. The teacher letter of recommendation is really looking at the student in the classroom. What type of a student are they? What type of a learner are they? Whereas the counselor letter is looking at it more in the context of the entire school. Um, so I like to say that the teacher is the, the narrow lens and the counselor is more of the wide lens, bigger picture. So therefore the teacher uh, recommendation can be more academic, um, more focused on one subject in particular. I, placement on, on the learner and the qualities that they brought to the classroom, both academically as well as personally, uh, also kind of showcases some of those classroom stories. What type of a student were they, learner were they? Um, and revealing some of those character traits um, or perhaps even uh, talents that appeared in terms of strength of writing or um, ability to analyze or, or that sort of thing. Then on the flip side, the counselor lens is a lot more holistic. It's less um, individual subject driven, but is giving an overview of the students' achievements at the school and the community. Also being able to give sort of relevant details about your school, right? So within the context of that school, is their curriculum average? Is their curriculum in the top 10%, top 1%? Uh, so providing kind of more specific information about um, whether that might be academic or whether that might be extracurricular. You know, some high schools are known for athletics or maybe a mock trial team or a specific arts program um, that, that you might need to provide some further context on. Uh, and also kind of talking about that, that four-year trajectory. And lastly, keeping in mind that um, sometimes the council letter is the place to sort of provide some of those important details, obviously with the student and parents' permission, but talking about any extenuating circumstances or learning disabilities or adversities that a student has overcome, uh, family dynamics, right? Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how to best phrase some of these talking points and how uh, to kind of allow colleges to read between the lines. So let's dive in a little deeper to the teacher letters of recommendation. So we first decided to uh, pose a couple of questions that um, you know, over Christy and I uh, compiled that we distribute to our teachers when it's time to, to write the letters of recommendation. Uh, so kind of thinking if the student was not in your class, how would it have been different? I know when I was on the admission side, I loved reading letters like this, right? Or uh, how did the student contribute to class? I, I was recently reviewing over a letter of recommendation from one of my colleagues and um, they had mentioned that this particular, they, they were doing an activity and turn the students loose and all of them looked to one student in particular who kind of led and moved forward. And I, I loved that example. Um, so, you know, active learner, active leader. Um, and then they also noted that the student made sure that everybody participated and had a voice, right? So how are they helpful? So giving specific examples um, in relations to these questions. I, so I, so I, we, we decided to list kind of some um, helpful questions here. If you asked other colleagues, would they say the same thing? What challenged the student? How did they respond? How did they challenge you? So when you're asking teachers to write letters of recommendation, sometimes it's hard to think of these examples right off the top of your head. Or as Sarbeth mentioned, maybe, you know, you have 20 students you need to write for and 
Um, you don't want to use the same terminology. So one I, uh, thing that Christy and I also helped compile was just different questionnaires that uh, we distribute to our teachers to have them give to students so the students can do some reflection. So if you want your letter to touch upon these points, these are maybe some points that you should be asking the student to also uh, bring to the table. So let's talk about how to organize your letter of recommendation. Uh, over and over again, we are hearing from college counselors that they really uh, like and prefer the bullet point letters of recommendation. And I know that for some people, they prefer kind of the narrative prose style. So in my office, we decided to kind of jump full on into bullet style letters of recommendation this year. Um, now that's on our college counseling side, so more on the council letter of recommendation, but we have also provided teachers with some templates and structures on how to write these teacher letters of recommendation. And that is difficult because this is a, a kind of a shift away, especially for teachers that have been teaching for a few decades. As Sarbeth was saying, she has more than two decades experience, right? So it's, it's hard for teachers to kind of uh, deviate from, from that structure. So these are some uh, general headers that we have provided with our teachers that they're able to utilize. Um, First and foremost, talking sort of about the curriculum and the student's experience within your class, any academic characteristics and intellectual growth, uh, engagement in the classroom and beyond, and just kind of an overall summary and recommendation. And it's great to give specific examples and highlight um, any work that, that they may have done along the way. Um, so in terms of kind of some do's and don'ts, it is good to provide context to your class or program. You do want to keep this sweet, uh, short and sweet, right? So are students expected to read 50 pages a night um, is, you know, so kind of giving some detail like that. Uh, it's also good to include two examples of uh, personal interaction with the student. Um, and if you're listing adjectives, be able to back those up with examples in, in that case. Uh, it's also good to gather information from the classroom observations and the quality of the work. And that's how uh, we encourage our teachers um, to kind of utilize the student recommendation request to gather this information. So the student, when they're making a letter of recommendation request from their teacher, has to sort of fill out a, a questionnaire and sort of a reflection piece. So this is asking students to also recall specific events from their class that they're proud of. Um, we also encourage students and teachers to set up meetings to kind of chat about those uh, letters of recommendation. So the student is to ask the teacher, provide that reflection, but also kind of then um, go through, you know, here are some points that I think it would be great to include and, and whatnot to, to gather that information. Uh, lastly, keep the letter to one page. Um, and, uh, and abide by all the deadlines. So those are kind of the main do's. Um, now, I, with, with respect to the don'ts, um, detail, credentials, background, um, your course description. I know when I was in admissions, it would be common that the first paragraph of a teacher letter of recommendation was all of the credentials of the teacher. You know, maybe they had a PhD from this respective college, they taught at a college. And while that's great, um, the letter's about the student, not about the teacher, not about the class necessarily. And quite frankly, I, I remember from my time in admissions, almost everyone said that their class was the most difficult and taught at the college level, right? So we want like examples from the student, you know? Also repeating a resume. I know when I was in admissions and I was would do letters of recommendation presentations, I think this was a difficult one for teachers to realize because one uh, teacher told me, um, that they included those examples of extracurricular activities because they thought that it meant that they knew the student better and that they knew them outside of the classroom. Um, and I had to say that it's important to remember that when an admissions officer is reading this application, they know already a great deal of information about the student, their GPA, their extracurricular activities, their test scores, they have their essays. So they are really looking for what kind of a student and learner they are, right? The generic letters also is, is a big one, right? So if you remove the name of the student, could you use that letter for others? And as Sarbeth mentioned, this happens a lot, right? As especially the junior year teachers are constantly tapped for writing letters of recommendation. And just this year alone, we had to talk to a couple of teachers because some of their paragraphs were quite similar. And although it was a great example, 
uh, we knew that students would be applying to some of the same schools and that might negatively reflect on, on them and their experience in the class. Uh, in, in terms of the list of adjectives, I, I think that's also kind of a common one, right? And it's very easy to think of, oh, this student is mature and hardworking and resilient, but the colleges want to know why are they resilient, right? Why are they mature? Why, what, how can they showcase that? Um, and quotes, I know also some teachers, it's their style to like rely very heavily on student quotes um, and they, or quotes from outside sources or quotes from the student. And they want, the colleges want to hear from the teacher themselves, right? Um, and, you know, we'll share also examples of how to kind of get at some of those harder questions. Uh, revealing sensitive and personal information, right? I, I mean, that is, I. Uh, incredibly important to ask students, um, you know, what they are comfortable with sharing, especially over this past year, as I know uh, COVID has impacted so many of our students and families in so many ways, you know, what are our are, are students comfortable sharing in those letters of recommendation and, and um, uh, kind of, it, well, it does provide context, you, you need permission with um, family information, health information, all of that. So reminding teachers, because sometimes, you know, teachers don't think they'll, they'll say something like, oh, you know, they're a great student and receive extra time. And, you know, and, and you have to make sure that you're, you have the student's permission to, to discuss those types of things. Um, and then I uh, finally, like the attractiveness, religion, race without a reason, I, you'd be surprised at how often that, that happens, right? Um, and in terms of, uh, recommenders, um, including information about that. Um, and as uh, Sarbath was talking, I kind of also just thought of a final one, but like you necessarily don't need an introduction or a conclusion. And I know this is so hard for teachers who are so used to that academic writing, but I love that intro that Sarbath said, I'm just going to jump right in, right? Here, here's the deal. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of like do's and don'ts in the process. Um, I questionnaires, there are so many different ones that uh, you can find online, but Christy and I have compiled a, a link. We call it the one pager that we're gonna share. My office is all about the one pagers that um, we like to compile, uh, that we're gonna share links and, and sample questionnaires. But um, this was a, kind of a combined one that Christy and I send to our different um, students that they prepare for their teachers. Uh, what do you think you have demonstrated in my class that I should praise? How have you demonstrated independence, initiative, responsibility? What is your experience in your intended field? Like if you know what you want to major in. Um, any part of my class that was challenging or eye-opening? What was your favorite unit that we discussed? And is there anything you want me to address about you? I kind of love that final one because it's sort of like that additional information question. It's sort of the catch-all, right? I And sometimes you'd be surprised what you can gain from that. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Christy and I uh, look forward to further discussion. Yes, I'm excited to share with you some tips that we found that work for us on the counselor side in crafting our letters of recommendation and the lens that we use to highlight our students from a school-wide perspective. Um, so Julie kind of mentioned earlier, we're a broad perspective and using more of a big picture of how the student fits into our school system and our community system. Um, and so we also kind of use the organized narrative that Julie referred to earlier um, and using the headers and bullet points. And we also want to talk about um, a pattern or a flow. So I know that for me, I find that I already had a natural pattern in the way I crafted my letters and how I was as a writer. And this just helped to organize my system and organize my thoughts as I was thinking about um, you know, really advocating for my student and portraying who they were. And so we want to maybe highlight how we've used that and using those specific bullets to hit certain topics. And so, you know, you definitely want to cover distinctive qualities for your student. We alluded to earlier, can that letter transfer from one student to another or is it repetitive characteristics that you're mentioning that could really go for multiple students and not an individual letter. Um, and as Sarbeth mentioned, they do read our letters a lot of times as a school. And so you wanna make sure that you are able to individualize your students. So again, this is not a form letter. I know a lot of times, particularly in public schools, there's some conversation about using a form letter. 
this is not a form letter. It's just a system to use to make sure that you are promoting your student in a systemic way. Um, Next, we wanted to kind of talk about examples. And for me, this was really interesting. And I shared with Sarah Beth earlier, I actually attended one of her presentations on letters of recommendation. And she really kind of um, talked about this pretty insistently about making sure that you are more specific with your recommendations and not very general. And I love using flowy language, such as this example with Gabriel, that he's so smart and charismatic. But really, when you read that intro sentence, what do you learn about Gabriel and how do you learn specific things about him that makes him stand out compared to other students? And how is that a concrete example? And so we've listed some things below, you know, Gabriel is smart because and given an example and Gabriel is talented because. And so that helps really the admissions office to see the student rather than just using adjectives. Um, it helps them to really have a better understanding how that student may fit on their campus, how they will interact in their community, what will they be like in their classrooms, and does your sentence really provide those kind of visualizations for the reader, or does it just provide a lot of great flowy words? Um, and I think I can connect with that first Gabriel sentence, because to do the bottom sentences, you really have to know the student. And as a public school counselor, I have or I did as of um, a couple years ago, we had over 500 students on our caseload. We just got a new counselor. So that has taken us down to around 370 a piece, um, which we're excited about, but I still have a hundred seniors on my caseload and we are a four year college going community. And so we still have to craft a lot of individual letters. And I don't know all 100 of my seniors. I wish that I did. I wish I had the opportunity to do that, to be able to give those specific examples. So we have put some things in place to try to help us craft those stories without spending um, enormous amounts of time with our students that we just don't have. And so we have found that students sometimes are very humble and really may struggle to brag on themselves. But if you get them to talking about their areas of passion, that you can find out some things about them. So we've tweaked our questionnaires to maybe hit on some of that so that we can find some personal stories. We've also found that parents do not have any humility in bragging on their students and they are a wealth of knowledge of great stories. And so we have tapped into that um, and they give great examples from the time they were in elementary school all the way up to um, giving us some stories that we can add. And then we've also found that teachers give a lot of great information because particularly in a public school setting, I may not see my students outside of the office very often to see them interact with others or to see them um, doing lab work or doing different things. And so if that teacher's not writing a letter of recommendation, then I may use those other teachers um, to get some examples and some personal stories that I can include in my part of the letter that conveys what a student like Gabriel may be like other than using just um, adjectives and um, flowy language. And so those nuggets can be really helpful and it kind of helps me as a counselor to work smarter and not harder. Plus that allows me to have the context that I need sometimes for students. So part of our job from the broader perspective is also to talk about where they fit and where our school fits in um, within our state, our community and other things. So like, for example, we typically try to include context of what our school is like, um, try to make sure we emphasize what's on our school profile and that that fits nicely together. Um, but also we give that context for students. For example, are they a transfer student? Did they transfer from a high school that didn't offer similar academics to what we did? Were they limited in the academic offerings that were offered to them? Um, did that impact the way we register them for courses for us? And then how does their home life, what does that look like in their ability to um, participate in extracurricular activities or to have access to um, certain opportunities? Could those be limited due to financial reasons or obligations outside of school that maybe they have to take care of siblings at home? Or we have a lot of students that now have um, grandparents that reside with them and they're having to help take care of that. We saw a lot of things with COVID shift and ability to interact outside of the school day. So as a counselor, those are things with permission that I 
can present and provide background information on. Then I also can talk about the academic piece. Um, and typically this is where the student questionnaire comes in, maybe why they pick certain courses. There are classes that I often think they would say would be their toughest courses. And they usually always surprise me with what they say was their toughest courses and why. And so those are really good questions to ask and to explore a little bit as to why they pick those, those classes. Um, that helps you to understand a little bit more about that student, but it also can give that context when they're reading for school as to maybe why they had certain courses that they took, whereas their peers may have taken different ones and can help stand them out, help them stand out a little more. Um, also college preferences, maybe explaining why certain colleges might be a good fit for them. If you know certain attributes that a college is looking for in their student population, maybe highlighting those in your letter. If leadership is a really big community service, um, amplifying those qualities in your letter, visionary, um, certain things and aspects that you know that a college might be looking for, or even a scholarship on that college campus might be looking for certain traits and characteristics in their students. And then moving into tips for the process. Um, Julie and I had great conversation, I feel like about this slide in particular, just because our dynamics in our offices look very different, but also very similar. Um, and so I thought it was really interesting and we thought we would tag team the slide together to just kind of talk through about mainly timeline and deadlines. Julie, do you want to kind of start with that? Sure, I, I'll say that I'm in my fourth year of college counseling. And so I know when I started, my school didn't necessarily have a process in place for submitting, right? So it was, uh, you know, submit by November 1 and then November 1 was nuts, right? And then I, when it came to the January um, deadline, we were all on winter break. And so it was difficult to know, okay, where is she submitting? Where am I supposed to be sending documents? So uh, over the last couple of years, we've been slowly trying to inch towards setting timelines and deadlines for our students and our parents so everybody is aware. Then we realized that we were doing this for students and parents, and we also needed to do the same for us as counselors and for our teachers. So in terms of students, our sort of office policy, obviously this doesn't always happen, but we try for it too, is that students should submit their applications two weeks before the posted deadline, just to give us time to compile those letters of recommendation, get everything sent and everything off. Um, but as we were kind of getting the students to comply with that and thinking ahead, we realized that we were not as timely in our letters of recommendation. So I, uh, and also we're gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, looking at bias and letters of recommendation too. And so this was a, a, a new policy and procedure that we put in place at, at Bowles this year, but I, we asked all of our teachers to turn in their letters of recommendation by October 1st so that we could uh, have the month of October to really review over those and kind of give feedback and um, uh, tweaks as, as needed. Um, and similarly with us in a, as college counselors, all of our letters will get re reviewed by one of our peer counselors at least one time. I probably I'd say this was a drastic shift for our teachers, right? Who uh, were, especially for teachers who've been there for a long time, who write excellent letters of recommendation. And, you know, we sort of got some questions on it, but I am really grateful that we did it this year as Christy and I were discussing Last year with COVID, students had the opportunity to learn virtually or in person and we had hybrid. And so I noticed there was a little bit of bias for teachers writing for students that were in the class versus online. And so we were able to kind of work with teachers to phrase uh, those instances and in, in the best way positive um, for the student. Um, so I'll, I'll let Christy share a little bit too, because we had fun discussing this side, slide. So I wish that we had the deadline um, in process, but that's something we're working towards with our student population and have tried to send out emails. We put on our social media this year. We have um, sent notices to parents to make sure that students were aware that waiting to the last minute 
what really cause more anxiety on their end than in many ways on ours because they want to see that box checked um, by the deadline time just as much as, as we do. And if you don't invite us to your common app until the night before the deadline, then you're gonna be anxious because if we have 60 of those that come in, then there's just no way that we can can accommodate that. And so we have really tried to push more education and understanding of that this year. And we have seen a rise in that. Our goal is to hit that harder earlier, like really starting junior meetings with that conversation of there will be early deadlines. You know, let's go ahead and start thinking about things because we've realized in waiting and talking to the seniors that we probably are waiting a little late to start those conversations and really emphasizing the importance of the deadline for them as much as it is for us. And I think what happens is they are so focused on their application part in certain portions that they don't think about letting us know and giving us access to where we can submit our portion in a timely manner. Um, so I definitely got some tips from talking to Julie on how we're gonna promote that a little better. The other piece that we talked about and that I've given some thought to is we don't review teacher letters and don't have conversations about what they're submitting, which through a lot of the conversation we've had is definitely something that we feel like we are probably going to implement a little more, particularly with teacher training on letters of recommendation and making sure that they understand the language that's used, the biases that can come into play. And also talking with them about deadlines and emphasizing that to students so that if we're saying a similar message, the teachers are saying they want their information in the same time frame that we're asking that maybe if students are hearing repetitive dates, that it will also drive that um, information home and that they'll start kind of heeding our request on those deadlines. Yes. So avoiding bias is such a hard thing to do, and especially the unconscious association where reading letters of recommendation, and like I mentioned, that was my all day today I've been reading. It was almost like I was studying and doing research for this presentation tonight. Um, and understanding that admissions officers don't hold it against the students, right? But just the phrases and the terminology sometimes, and actually before I get too far down avoiding bias, on the last slide, and thank you, Julie, greatly appreciate it, the one page bullet points. I, oh my, I'm in love with the one page bullet points. Like it is, I read a school today and I literally wrote down the name of the school because I was going to email the counseling office and say thank you, um, that it wasn't so much bullet points, but it was categories, right? Students' background, about three sentences. Academic preparation, about three sentences. Uh, qualities that are achievements that are unique to this student, about three or four sentences. I was like, thank you, because I had a lot of students from that school. So instead of sifting through and saying, okay, what, where's the fluff? What's, it was a very concise um, template, right? And so even though you can have a template, it, it doesn't mean that they were all the exact same. The, the flow of the bullet points were very organized. So yes, thank you. As, as I, had to, I had one letter, to, one counselor letter that was about two and a half pages and I was like, oh, Oh no, no, no. So going back to bias, um, it is, and, and Julie mentioned um, about just even the, the students who were in person versus the virtual learners. And I've seen that. I, I have really seen that in that. Um, and you can write a strong letter for a virtual uh, student learner. I, I read a couple today that was just talking about how the student was still engaged. The student always had their camera on, even when there was Zoom fatigue, Zoom burnout. Uh, the student tried to uh, engage the fellow students by saying 
funny things about the lecture in the chat because the teacher allowed the chat function. So there's ways that you can still uh, talk about the students, but the bias that is typically the most seen in letters are gender and race and ethnicity biases. And so we can go through that. I think the next slide, uh, so the gender bias, <laughs> Um, phrases that are so oftentimes associated with those who are female, and you don't even realize it. Um, this student is a spitfire. You wouldn't really say that about a, a young man. He's a spitfire. And it's those phrasing like, oh, they, they, um, they're they such a hard worker and they grind to make sure that everyone is happy and continue. And so when, when you're thinking about gender biases, think about the letter. Would I use these same adjectives, these same descriptions if gender was neutral or, or if this was the opposite gender? And if the answer is no, then you probably want to think about not using that because you're setting the students um, up in a very different framework, which isn't fair, right? Because they're all are applying to college. They're all applying to the same types of institutions and no college has two different tracks for male students and female students. So if your adjectives are not interchangeable, then thinking about how can I, how can I use terms or adjectives or descriptors that if it is a male student or a female student or a non-binary student, the phrasing would not change. And that is the thing that I have really noticed that, that the terms and the descriptors sometimes can be very different and it's, it's, not, it's, it's not equal, right? because you're, you're admitting students, not only for the community field, but their academic and their analytical abilities. And so those should not be based on any gender. And then the next one is race and uh, ethnic bias, which I think that comes across in letters uh, to the point where sometimes I'm almost like, I, I, it is shocking to me. I, I, you can tell by, and Christy knows me well, I'm never at a loss for words, but it is downright shocking, <laughs> the, the bias against race and ethnicity that comes across. Uh, this student is so articulate. This student coming from such a, um, a background as his, this student is not the traditional fill in the blank, right, race. I'm like, wait, what, what, what do we mean by that? Are we painting a stereotype on this student? And like Julie said, now, if race or ethnicity is a part of who this student is, right? This student um, is part of DEI work because of X, Y, and Z. That's one thing. But to mention a student's race or ethnicity or even social economic background that has no bearing on their application that has no, um, is not associated with their application. It's just really throwing it out there for no reason. And one phrase, and I've already mentioned it, but it's it's one I'll just say is a little bee in my bonnet, is when particularly for black males, it, it the phrase, he is so articulate for blah, blah, blah. Or, and it's do what we use that same term in another term, that actually my office was talking about recently. And, and again, knowing that these terms and these phrases are not meant for any uh, negativity, any negative, no one is writing a letter out of malice because thankfully, and um, when I worked on the high school, we always did like a thank you something for our teachers who wrote letters because we know that you are volunteering that and the students applications wouldn't be complete without it. But even phrases like this is an all American guy or this is an all American girl. Well, what does that mean? Um, what image are you trying to paint? And if all American doesn't mean the same for you as me, then your messaging is being lost, right? And so instead of trying to use these uh, phrases, and I was even talking to my office, uh, I knew I use very uh, regional terms. 
sometimes where I will say something and I, I was talking to some of my students when I was on the high school side and I said something I'm like, Miss Fleming, what does that mean? I was like, that is very regional. And I am a little older than them. I was like, this might be a regional dated term that after talking to the students, I was like, oh, if I would have used that in a letter of recommendation, someone may not have understood what I was trying to say. So being very cautious that someone is reading your letter that may come from a very different background, a very different culture, um, different age. I mean, you have people working in admissions from very early 20s to 70s, right? And so even sometimes the age of your terminology could be lost. So making sure that the language that you use is something that no matter who reads it in whatever context they're reading it, your message is being clear. And then also for international students, um, it is very important that, that to try to um, think about the education for international students and the letters of recommendations for international students in the, again, in the context that they're an international student, if that plays a role on their application. Some international students' letters of recommendations truly should be no different than their other classmates and peers. They may be an international student, but have been in the US for 12 or 15 years and have dual citizenship. So them being an international student may not really have any context on their educational background, but then again, it could, right? And so really, not painting it with a broad paintbrush of, this is an international student, here's what I say about international students. And looking at each student in their own um, context and the cultural norms and understanding that, um, you know, some international students or even not even international, but depending on religious students, I was reading a student who uh, outside of school had, um, had uh, a lot of extracurricular in their faith. And so how is that played into account? And like Christy said, the, uh, the questionnaires and the surveys, sometimes as a college counselor, you may not know that. And so you're thinking, oh, this student really doesn't do anything around school. Well, they may you know, be learning a whole different language through their faith and their context. And so really, making sure that we're understanding that piece of a student. But again, like Julie said, if it plays a role in the context of their application, right? And so they may say, yeah, I'm an international student, but yeah, <laughs> it doesn't really make a difference to me. And so then you don't wanna write a whole letter about them being an international student because when the colleges are reading the application in the totality, and if the counselor whole letter is about being the, them being an international student and what that means, and nowhere in where the students write, it's like, is this the right letter? Is this the right name? The, these two things are not connected. And I don't know if anyone wants to say anything else about that piece. No, I think we're good. We're gonna move on to our um, one pager that we created and I just shared the Google Doc form so that you could access that um, as well. But we wanted to share with you some resources that we utilize um, in our offices and wanted to put that information out there for those of you that are attending and watching um, and so that you could have access to some things as well. And so we want to just take a moment though to thank the college counseling offices of the Bowl School. Um, there's something from North Oconee High School and Roland Hall um, who has also provided resources that they have allowed to be shared with others. And so just kind of want to highlight a little bit um, what those cover. We alluded to several of the items during our parts of the presentation, but we do have lots of guide for teachers and we've tried to chunk things by the teacher resources and then by the counselor resources so that you could look at the information that apply to you and in your format that you will be writing a letter from. And so we've got, you know, a, a guide for teachers as well as different recs that you can look at, but also we wanted to give you the sample teacher letter recommendation form that you can take a look 
um, at to see and we've got those linked as well so that you can have access to those and maybe if there are things you wanted to tweak on that to create your own um, it, again as Julie and I were talking there were differences that we found within our forms they were very similar in the broad context but there was maybe a, a question or two different that would work better for her population and then as well for mine and very similar coming through on the counselor side and we wanted to make sure that we drew attention to just release today hot off the press um, the college essay guide just released a vast resource for counselors and so lots of great information is included in there and it's very well organized um, did not feel overwhelming for me sometimes when there's a lot of information it can look overwhelming but he has it very well organized and put out um, in a very palatable way and we also wanted to give different recommendation samples but also our student questionnaire and then a parent questionnaire and an example of one of the differences that we have um, on the student questionnaire is for our population we would ask if a student was first generation just because that is part of our population that we have within our campus and a lot of times students don't share that information with us um, through conversation and so we found that if we added that to our form we realized um, who those students were that might need a little more support that we did not have access to that information in another way so again as you take time to kind of review those and look at those you can pick and choose and create your own or I, I, we're good with you utilizing what we've put out there um, for you to to put towards your school and whatever you feel is a good fit for your um, population and your community. Julie, do you want to add anything to that since we had a lot of fun putting this page together? Yeah, no, we just wanted everyone to have a takeaway, basically. I, I was like attending sessions and being able to kind of keep something. So hopefully you can utilize this for your offices and share with your uh, colleagues and teachers. And finally, we also wanted to share some teacher letters of recommendation. Um, in the interest of time, we'll just go through one example together, but we did include a link and there are several examples there. Um, these are all mainly teacher letters of recommendation, but um, if you, yes, thank you, Christy. Um, if everyone wants to just take two minutes or so to read the first letter, and then I can kind of um, review over some takeaway points that um, would be helpful. So I'll set a timer and, and keep it on the clock and I'll give it a minute or two for everyone to read this first letter. Okay, so I'm just going to give a little bit of feedback. Um, Christy, can you go to the beginning of the, there we go, right there. So in the first paragraph, um, the recommender ends with seeing that the student is dynamic, bright, and self-motivated. And again, we had commented about listing, avoid listing adjectives without backing those up. Uh, in the next paragraph, they had commented some great facts, but a lot of which was already is already going to be present in the other aspects of the application. She's ranked number one in her class. She's enrolled in this class. She's taken this many AP. She's won this awards. She's an AP scholar. All of that is going to be already listed in other parts of the application. So it's not needed to really uh, discuss um, in the in the teacher letter of recommendation. Um, if you're looking at the third paragraph, they end that third paragraph by saying, in my 
10 plus years of teaching, I can honestly say that Eileen is the strongest student that I've ever taught. Statements like that are very powerful. Now, make sure you're not seeing that about every student, right? As, as colleges will read in school groups, but I do think like a statement like that is incredibly powerful. But then if you jump to the fourth paragraph saying that the strong work ethic and quiet confidence, that exhibits a little bit of that gender bias in females tending to focus on the work ethic versus the accomplishments, right? The ability versus what they've actually done. Um, and then moving forward in that paragraph and when they're talking about extracurricular activities and saying she does track and cross country and indoor track and rifle, um, that is a bit of a repetition of the student's resume. Um, so not necessary to include there unless there was something specific or particular to your school that would be worth sharing. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, we're not going to go through all of the examples, but there are several um, that uh, you're, you're welcome to kind of go through and, and look at and um, I kind of then compare and contrast, right? So um, uh, being able to say, okay, which letter did I learn more from or not, or this and that. So hopefully that's a helpful exercise for you. Um, and feel free to share this link with um, your colleagues and teams and whatnot. And if there's any questions, Christy, I don't know if you wanna include our contact information at the end and um, everyone's also welcome to list questions in the chat. Yes. And one thing I can I wanted to jump in with the letter, Julie. I think it was, I think what will happen is that some people may look at that letter, right, and think, oh, this is a long letter and it looks like it's a lot of information and think it's a great letter, right? But as you saw, I had to go and look, was like, hold on, this is a math teacher writing because it was very much more in line with what a counselor letter would be about the track and about um it, it i i what i remember i was talking to a math teacher one time and the letter sort of looked like this and and they put in there sort of like what this teacher did about how it was the best in 10 years right or the best in however long teaching career I said but why and this teacher and i knew each other. i said well why are they one of the best were their analytical skills when they did blah, blah, blah. It's like, put that in the letter. Well, uh, uh, I, uh, an admissions officer probably wouldn't understand it. That is true. You are 100% correct with that because I would not know what you're talking about with the quantitative. And But I know you know what you're talking about. And I can make a note of that. And some admissions officers uh, committees are made up of faculty members, right? And so I may not know, understand it 100%, but the math teacher who may be in the admissions committee will understand it 100% or we could farm it out to a professor at Emory or Davidson or wherever I've worked before and say, hey. And so to have a, a teacher rec, I, I read a file I remember a couple of years ago, all three letters were the exact same. The counselor rec, the teacher and the two teacher reps, because they all started with a narrative of here's how many APs they have, here's how many, you know, AP scholar, blah, blah, all three teachers, counselor, and both two teachers and the counselor. And then the very next paragraph, the student runs track, the student does this, that, and the other. And I was like, okay, two wasted opportunities to see the intellectual depth of the student because all three were basically counselor reps. And all three basically were the students' extracurricular activities and school information on their common app in narrative form. <laughs> so it's like, there's nothing more I'm getting from the three letters of recommendation that I didn't already see in the application. Just wanted to throw that out there. I think those are really good points that sometimes we forget. Um, I've heard a counselor say before, you know, it's really kind of like a billboard, real, you know, opportunity. You're able to market your student through your letters and that you miss those opportunities if you don't utilize the space you're given to do that. So I think you're dead on that sometimes those are wasted on repetitive things that people already know rather than bringing new information to the table. 
there is a question in the chat. As an IEC, how do we help our students guide their teachers, or is that a no-no? And I would just say, I think you two gave great um, information with questionnaires, or even if a school doesn't offer a questionnaire, I was talking to a student recently, and they attend a large public school, and they said, hey, we don't get questionnaires. Say, so email the teacher and say, thank you for writing a letter of recommendation for me. Here's why I asked you. Here's the lesson that really jumped out in my mind when you taught me. And so that way, even though the teacher is not asking for a letter recommend uh, or information or a questionnaire, you're giving the teacher specific examples that when they're writing, they can have something tangible to say about a lesson that you really were gravitated to or why you're asking that teacher. And I think as an IEC, you can help a student if the, if the school doesn't have questionnaires or forms to fill out, you can help that student craft that email back to the counselor or to the teachers and say, here's why I asked, here's a lesson that I really, um, gravitated to, thank you so much for writing a letter recommendation for me uh, because of X, Y, Z. Here's my passion of why I want to major in math and having you as a math instructor really opened up quantitative, whatever, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that's a way that as an IEC, you could help that student craft the, those emails. And if the school has questionnaires as an IEC, you can help make sure that they um, um, fill out those questionnaires in the best possible way. I've seen questionnaires where families, we give it to the families and the the reply back is, oh, my student is a really nice student. And I'm like, that, that gives me nothing. <laughs> like I have to write a letter and all I have is that they're nice. And so really helping the student and the parents think deeper um, as an IC. Any, well, thank you so much, Julie and Christy, for doing this. Any parting uh, uh, words of advice you would want to leave? And like I mentioned, we will have this uh, on SACAT's website. And so people may come back and look at it at different times of the year. Any parting advice? Christy, I'll start with you. I would just say, you know, don't hesitate to ask questions or use your resources. You know, if you have connections with a college rep or college counselors or um, other people that do a lot with writing letters of recommendation, definitely use those resources and don't hesitate to reach out and ask for feedback. I thought that um, Julie made a great suggestion that within their office, they read each other's letters. And that was something that I had never thought about before. But after kind of chewing on that and pondering that a little further, I could see where that really could be an opportunity for your department to grow, for you to grow as a writer. Um, also, when I think about just the vast knowledge like the Sarbeth and Julie have from being readers, and I have never been on that side, I think it's um, really good to get feedback from people that get to do that and get to see a vast number of types of letters to give you some feedback and thought too. So, um, you know, I think if you are writing letters and have some, some questions or just would like feedback, definitely seek out some resources to do that. Yeah, and, and take it one step at a time, right? I mean, when I, when I said we have each other read each other's um, letters, this kind of started piecemeal. It was, hey, can you just look at this one? And then we said, let's look at the top 10% of the class, you know, since we know they're applying different places. And then it just became, we actually liked doing it for each other. So um, I wanted to add that onto Christy, but my final piece of advice also would be don't be so hard on yourself either, right? We're all human at the end of the day. And I know I'm guilty. I want to write the perfect letter. And sometimes that can take hours. And as we know, colleges are spending maybe a minute on these letters, right? So you've, you've got to balance. And at the end of the day, you need sleep. You have 100 students to write for. And I, I think the colleges are, are going to understand that. And so some students, it's that letter flows very easily. Some it doesn't. But don't be so hard on yourself. You know, like sometimes I set timers and I say to myself, if I'm not done, then I'm going to kind of 
do my best and submit it because I've got X more students to write for, you know? Um, so that would just kind of be my final piece of advice. Absolutely. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Christy. And Julie, yes, I 100% when I'm reading letters, uh, when I'm reading applications, one of the first things I look to see is how large is the senior class? And then how many counselors are there? And then I do my quick division and I'm like, like Christy has 125 letters to write. So I, if, if I'm looking for the messaging, right? Versus is there fluff and there's, there's rainbows. Don't need that. <laughs> and then I know though, if, if there's a school that has one counselor for every 20 students, yes, they may write two pages, but is that two pages giving me any meat or is it just two pages that's lovely and rainbows and flowers, but I walk away with nothing. And so a letter that is quick bullet points, like I mentioned the header letter, that was one page that I will be emailing at school tomorrow morning, thanking them. Um, that was wonderful because I knew that I wasn't missing the information. And so I think to think about letters of recommendation, the most important thing is conveying the information that is needed to help the context of the student, because we're all here to help students and to make sure that their next step in their educational career is a step that's appropriate and wonderful for them to thrive. And so making sure that none of the information is lost Cannot thank you two enough. This was so wonderful and so helpful. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Thank you everyone who is listening. Stay tuned to more uh, college admissions workshops, formerly known as Minicamp College, but college admissions workshops. We will have a series of these, both for parents, guardians, and students, as well as counselors of any sort. And so always feel free. The next one is next month. So hope to see you there. Thank you.